Section 13 of The Desirable Alien at Home in Germany by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12 Lions and Lace Curtains. There was an old municipal featured gentleman in the train going to Hildesheim, and I asked him if he could tell us of a good hotel there. For once, Joseph Leopold and I were not en pays de connaissance. We had got a fit of visiting places strange to us both. He thought and thought. Finally, he warmed to the subject and recommended the E dash off. It was late, I was tired. Joseph Leopold had a potential wrangle about the luggage in prospect, so I went out alone and took rooms. Across the dreary, modern-looking station enclosure, I saw hospitable lights quivering, and by night I could not tell that there were horrible lace curtains to the coffee-room window, stained yellow, like the coffee-coloured laces worn years ago by the aesthetes. These curtains were looped into bands of old gold, dating back to the same artistic period and yellow lace curtains now and henceforth spell for me the abomination of desolation in the way of hotels, and if ever I see this insignia of horror I give the place of entertainment that is foolish enough to advertise it a very wide berth. I have come to know since that e hops all over Germany flaunt it. e hops seem to be the generic name for hotels of this stamp, that old gentleman in the train going to Hildesheim must have been animated by some strong esprit de corps. Perhaps he was the chairman of the committee of the Gordon Dash, I mean the E Dash Hoffs Limited. I know not, but I have never forgiven him. We dined abominably in a varnished deal matchboard dining room and after dinner, all in the dark, we walked out and took a tram away from the station neighbourhood, right into the heart of Hildesheim. The tram passed through a long, lighted street set with shops on either side, handsome shops with large, inviting faces that flashed invitation to us across the dark they illuminated, and at last, in a ghostly, ill-lighted platz, we dismounted, and there... We were in the Middle Ages. Towering cathedral spires seemed to loom over us, painted eaves and cornices to tickle our ears as we wandered along entranced from ghostly plaats to ghostly plaats, accompanied by the sound of bells from the many church steeples whose buttresses varied the uneven house line. It seemed as if, once past that, tram bestridden and glass-faced main street every house in hildesheim was painted and gargoyled and initialled with its owner's family name and the date of its building far back in the sixteenth century and still in the dark we came to a low shiny oaken doorway humble unobtrusive suggestive of good entertainment of browning for gravies and of glazed hams and the smoke of many flambeaux held under the archway of its entrance the porch of the Wienerhof. Over the doorway, all across the façade, interrupted only by the principal windows of the principal rooms, the legend of Europa and the Bull was carved and painted and blazoned. Peering under the blinds of the Speisesaal, we could see the officers sitting at their meat, the points of their swords clumsily resting on the ground beside their chairs. We could see that the room where they were was dimly lighted, but enough that there were carved stalls and stag's antlers on the walls to be used as prongs to hang the hats and coats on. And Joseph Leopold swore that what these connoisseurs were eating was little crabs stewed in wine. He ordered me to go in, use my newly acquired German, and engage rooms at once for tomorrow. I did. I entered a hall not very large, with an uneven, very uneven floor, 
and no gilding. An old family-looking butler came forward to meet me and showed me two rooms at six marks each, including breakfast. Breakfast was in the breakfast room downstairs. As the Wienerhof understands breakfast, it was the right kind of breakfast. Several sorts of rolls, good butter and good jams, and best of all, though not for everyone, goose grease to spread on those rolls. A great many Germans take Genzafett for breakfast. It is the best thing for your health in the world, but as I said before, not for everyone. Then we had Mittages and the German midday meal, and the important one of the day. That is one of the difficulties for aliens when in Germany, aliens whose habits are corrupted by English and French late dining. The only thing to do is to steal a plat or two from the lunch and put it in the dinner or Abendessen. This rule is useful, of course, in eating places where there is a set menu and you take it. If you dine a la carte, and at the Wienerhof they preferred you to dine a la carte, it is different. You get what and as much as you like. Do English people know what a really good Aufschnitt is? There is everything in the world in it. You do not have to dig for discoveries. Everything is fairly set out on a large flat dish. The trouble is that it takes you quite a long time to overlook it all. There are sure to be some slices of ham and some slices of veal. I'm never surprised if I meet beef or tongue. In the middle there is certainly a pièce de résistance, cockle shell full of the gem of all, herring salat. Round the rim are slices of all sorts of sausage, leberwurst, of cheese, little heaps of caviar and chopped beetroot, gherkins and capers and all this diversion, this plethora of interest, for one mark fifty. I have tasted a maimed Aufschnitt, a faint reminder of this gorgeous dish at a place in London, but how far away it is from the stability, the certainty of the German inn's catering. Enough of this. I shall be called greedy, and I think I am. I have taken to German cookery as no alien could ever have hoped to. I care nothing for what my grandfather probably called French kickshaws. All grandfathers did. I detest the eternal omelette of France, the eternal pommes frites, the same good sauce, I don't say it isn't good, disposed over everything. Dinner that night, though not perhaps a dream, was at any rate a charming reality. And next morning, before we were properly awake, a deep bell tolled, and we were told by the solemn butler that one of the canons of Hildesheim had died, and that his funeral sermon was to be preached that day by his fellow canon and confrere in the famous abbey church of Hildesheim. I knew I was going to be harrowed, for church ceremonies always do harrow me, and this one would surely be performed with much unction, for the canon who lay under the eleven-yard-wide black pall was deeply beloved. I dressed myself as soberly as a traveller could compass, and Joseph Leopold and I went in and took our places in the solemn black-draped church under the circular candelabra set with jewelled emblems and enamelled discs, which Bishop Hazelow gave to Hildesheim. In front of the altar stood the quite plain and prehistoric porphyry pillar that people come miles to see. It was not always placed inside the church, and some say that such a pagan emblem has no business there. Kneeling black crowds bent all round us, and together we all wallowed in woe and wept for an old gentleman whom I had never seen. Like a thunderstorm with terrible lures and sullen boomies, the Dies Irae resounded through the aisles. I can never stand the Dies Irae, I mean without crying. And moreover, there were impressive circumstances about this funeral. This defunct priest was adored by his colleagues. A personal friend pronounced the eulogy and broke down midway in sobs and tears. 
so that the rest of his discourse could hardly be heard. Afterwards we were shown the treasury of Hildesheim. I grew bewildered with the luxuriance of jewelled croziers and mitres, faint with a desire for the flagons and chalices set with gems that winked and coruscated, safe from me in their velvet cases. Alas, all that coruscated was not a gem of the purest ray. Glass had taken the place of the rubies and emeralds which had made the treasury of Hildesheim the centre of the desires of greedy contending potentates. Then we went into the sacristy, where treasure of another sort is gathered. I am a little jarred by the sight of bones, with their ugly, suggestive, articulated ends swathed in blue velvet and tinsel, and of microscopic kreutz articles in pretentious jewelled and velvet cases looking like ravaged birds' nests, and tiny skulls of martyrs, whose size does credit to the heart of the owners rather than to their intellects. But, after all, believers must have something to take hold of, and, indeed, these fibulas of St. Tierburger, these thigh-bones of St. Remigius, have seen much service and submitted to much handling. Every Catholic church in Germany possesses a due amount of them, and at least one chaise studded with holes where the jewels used to be. The sight saddens me. Yet I once trafficked in a relic, and sent attested portions away to my Catholic friends. They were unclassifiable portions of the rotten wood, which had formed part of the coffin of St. Cuthbert of Durham, sweepings of the floor, unconsidered morsels from the point of view of the antiquaries who were collating them. Still, they seemed very considerable to Father Michael in Paris, to whom I sent a little piece as big as would lie on a sixpence, and which he accepted with the attestation of a canon of Durham for his church. Why not? It had been part of the coffin of an English saint who died and was buried in Lindisfarne in Northumberland in the first century, was carried by devout monks to Durham, where his shrine formed one of the wonders of the British Isles. And many of the queer little oddments enshrined in glass cases in this sacristy at Hildesheim and others at Limburg and Marburg, are no more important or bulky, and less authentic, though they have had gorgeous caskets made for them, and have been treasured for centuries. My patient, slightly aloof, humble, yet unconsciously sceptical attitude in the face of such valuable trifles, always annoys Joseph Leopold, and we never make a very long stay in these emporia of holy material. We got outside and walked about in the garden which has grown up in the ruins of the cloisters, and looked at the Holy Rose of Hildesheim, which is one thousand years old, was planted by Charmaine, and still grows and blows. The bush we see is a sucker of the original tree, and it is tended most scrupulously by a service of four gardeners. And in the evening we went to the circus. It was like the country circus one reads of in old English novels with lions and ladies and tigers and tamers. In a platz behind the Wienerhof an enormous tent had been erected, a tent whose ceiling sagged and drooped and was very ill-lit, thus producing all sorts of beautiful Rembrandt effects and under this stained grey canopy, like a murky rain-clouded heaven, the lights danced and flickered on the sandy arena, and lovely females ambled round on bare-backed, handsomely caparisoned steeds, and cavaliers in dusky raiment fought for the lady rider of their choice, and finally carried her off, slung across their saddle-bar, while shots were fired, and noise enough was made to dragged down the weather that lurked in the swelling thunderclouds of the roof. Then the scene changed, and the fire-eater came on and ate fire and hot coals, and tied up a lad in a basket and ran a sword through it in the approved fashion. But the real joy of the evening was the lions. After a long interval, the arena was cleared, and a dozen or so large sections of iron grating 
very like our old nursery fender and curved in much the same way, were brought in. These were the component parts of the large circular cage in whose safekeeping the deadly fire were to pursue their revolutions and which was to be conscientiously built up before our very eyes. Slowly, methodically, the work was proceeded with. These tall slats were set up and bolted together one by one, four bolts to each section. And see you don't forget it. The public will not let you off a single bolt. All eyes were fixed on the tremendous safeguard, and the least preterremission of a bolt would have been seized upon and corrected. In what seemed an incredibly long time, each bolt was tapped into its ward by the painstaking official, and the iron enclosure twelve feet high rose complete before us. Then the gates opened, and the great, brave, big-headed lions trooped in lazily to the number of twelve, and took up their positions on plaster plinths placed there for them. They looked sleepy, well-fed, and hopelessly decadent. A lion in a cage has no status. It is an anomaly. The ages looking down deride, and the beasts feel their position. These show lions must have lost caste in any feline paradise, for a man has known how to make them look ridiculous. I hate to see them. I do not know why unless it is the enormous head and the encolure of the locks that make its form all out of focus, but a lion always reminds me of a musical virtuoso, all head and no body. Then the employer of all this wasted strength, the dictator of these masses of useless muscle and taut sinew, the tamer, appeared. He was limp, unscrupulous, anxious-looking, and he continuously lashed the whip that is his safety. One knows somehow that every random flip counts, that the continuance of that trivial sound in the air is imperative, like drum taps keeping up the martial fervour which makes men die by rote, or the music that is the derivative of the tightrope dancer. A nervous dread lest the air should cease to be stirred by that tenuous tang, should settle into quiescence and give all the forces of death leave to rush in, permeates my whole being while the ceremony goes on. I can hardly bear it. And the lion tamer is not so hardened to his dreadful trade, but that his eyes fixed on the dangerous couple of brutes or so, who were the ringleaders of a possible rebellion, are altogether void of fear, while his lips, pressed tight in the effort of a habitual hold of himself, are an incitement to nervous terrors. I soon ascertained the identity of the more villainous beasts he had to reckon with. I noticed that he was careful of the third lion from where I was sitting, and of the next but one to him. On these two lions he did not play the worst tricks, but he left them alone as much as possible. He seemed to have confidence in a rather solid, clumsy one, and poked him up frequently, and even used him for that fearful example of the art of taming, that is, he put his head in between his open jaws for an appreciable second. Perhaps that lion's teeth were drawn or filed away. I hope so. Which of us was the more relieved when the show was over, and after a gruesome twenty minutes the poor fellow made his bow, accepted the plaudits that were the award of his skill and faded away out of the arena, he or I. I pictured him over his glass at the anchor, perhaps saying to himself, another day in safety, another peril overpassed. But I dare say he said nothing of the sort. I dare say he went home sober and kissed his children and thought no more about it. A small, sprightly lady came on next and manoeuvred about with tigers. But I felt somehow that her beasts had been drugged out of all natural impulses of violence. She was obviously nervous. She was excitable, flighty. She minced and strutted in the jaws of death as if she didn't believe in it at all. 
but she too went bravely through her allotted span of eventful minutes in that glare and then out of it to a lover's arms perhaps one invents these stories and now i must take the bitter taste out of my mouth with a pretty story it is connected with that fine character henry the lion it is connected with england too those ill-nurtured plantagenets geoffrey and richard of england distrusted their father's intimacy with his german relative prince henry considering that the latter fomented their own disputes with their parent they resolved to do their best to break the intimacy they chose an occasion when the said gallant prince was on a visit to them in england they carefully spread a report that henry the lion was no prince of the blood but just a needy adventurer to put the matter beyond a doubt their foolish father signified his willingness that their guest should be put to a very crucial test one which the princes declared would satisfy them the lion they said is the king of the forest and knows a royal prince by instinct accordingly let one of our royal lions therefore be confronted by this proud saxon and it will then be plainly shown that he has no right to the rank which he has assumed the old henry agreed and directed that one of the most ferocious of the palace minees should be let loose on his guest as he walked unsuspecting in the courtyard after meat henry the lion put to the trial was true to his name he showed no fear but approached the savage beast and called to it in a tone of royal authority as he was used to the surprise and disappointment of the conspirators and possibly the delight of their father the lion crouched back at his feet and allowed the saxon prince to lead it quietly back to its den from that moment naturally all doubts as to his princely descent were stilled and his influence with henry of england was confirmed and later on when his tempestuous virtues had made him an exile from his own patrimony he took asylum in england and the royal palace at winchester was assigned to him his duchess and her children as a residence end of section thirteen Section 14 of The Desirable Alien at Home in Germany by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 Grand Dukes and Gypsies. On entering a little German town, the capital may be of some small German principality, a dukedom, or an electorate of the past, I always find myself thinking of some lines of Browning's. Ours is a great wild country. If you climb to our castle's top, I don't see where your eye can stop. For when you've passed the cornfield country, where vineyards leave off, flocks are packed, and sheep range leads to cattle tract, and cattle tract to open chase, and open chase to the very base of the mountain where, at a funeral pace, round about solemn and slow one by one row after row up and up the pine trees go so like black priests up and so down on the other side again to another greater wilder country that's one vast red rear burnt out plain branched through and through with many a vein whence irons dug and coppers dealt look right look left look straight before beneath they mine above they smelt copper ore and iron ore and forge and furnace mould and melt and so on more and ever more till at the last for a bounding belt comes the salt sand hoar of the great seashore and the whole is our duke's country my people used to read that aloud to me as a child and I, except for the first and last lines of the bit I have quoted, understood nothing. They began slowly, worked up the agony gradually, and ended with a sort of triumphant lilt, 
as if it were a cock robin story with the dramatic culmination accompanied by a final gesture a hoist of the knee a clapping of the palms together or any poignant touch that may aid the child mind in a kindergartenish way to appreciate the recitation took place in the studio i could rest my eyes on a watercolour drawing of my father's which had i been old enough to distinguish the features of it from the colours would have shown me just such a country as browning described there in the foreground stands schloss elz the famous spot in the valley of the mosel a feudal fortress with moat barbican portcullis and all the rest of it the vineyards that the poet speaks of wind up to the summit and clothe the rampart with their verdure but the brownish stone defences of the castle are plainly visible over the brow of the moor breaking the skyline in the picture are the first faint signs the picture was painted in eighteen sixty of the industrial and engineering development of germany on the escarpment of the stone quarry of the neighbouring hill the grey smoke faintly stains the pellucid sky and adumbrates the fires of essen for there in eighteen sixty was already established the little colliery the forerunner of the quote, drear red burnt-up plain unquote, that industry has made out of a garden quote, beneath they mine above they smelt unquote. and our duke is there today just as much a king or prince as ever except that the kaiser has opened his fist and taken away the sinews of war and sneaked the executive from him at s dash the herzog's retainers are by way of being handymen about the place they garden and empty buckets and wait at table dividing the work between them or sometimes going over in a body to one particular employment as the exigencies of much state and few pence to keep it up with may dictate and in the embrasures of the castle rampart on the tiny plots that maintains a grey beard in a sentry box or a master of the horse in regimentals stand the poor little cannon that the lord of p dash may not fire off except to frighten the crows from his vines footnote i regret to observe that our author here drops into the insular nonsense that distinguishes the english attitude towards the german princes a german reigning prince king or grand duke has an establishment regulated by protocol which he is just as much bound to keep up as any other sovereign and which is provided for in the usual way by a civil list the mediatized princes on the other hand are private gentlemen many of them extremely wealthy some poor but all of them living as they please they are distinguished from ordinary mortals by the fact that they are tronfeis that is to say capable of marrying reigning sovereigns without the union being morganatic such a family as that of tech many of these mediatized princes have the right to support a small number of armed men in uniform for the protection of their residences from burglars and i suppose it was the sight of such a seneschal a penchant of butler armed with a muzzle-loading gun at the gate of the castle of s dash that moved our author to her singular views as to the employment of the servants of german noblemen the old gentleman with the muzzle-loading gun would never do anything more active for the remainder of his life than take a tip for all the world like a similar functionary at the duke of northumberland's castle of annick for showing visitors the exceedingly horrible picture gallery j l f m h end footnote at braubach on the rhine in some respects the most perfect reminder of those days after you have mastered a hill that tries the tendons of your knees to desperation you top up the fatigues of the ascent by crossing the drawbridge and toiling up the steep flight of steps which for the sake of modern convenience have replaced the almost perpendicular way into the courtyard the lord of braubach and his knights 
returning a weary and foredone from the raid or the foray, used to have to ascend this passage, riding still on their horses before they could enter into their impregnability. There is the castle well, the only source of water in a siege, and the great bakehouse with the stores of flour, probably laid in before the castle's belly arose, were made into bread for the garrison. Bread and water. German Ritters, fighters in a small way, had often to be content with such fear for many a long month, and in, quote, the chamber next an anteroom, unquote, is the Rittersaal we see now, lived in, as a rule, full of what Browning used to tell me he cordially admired, quote, grandiose, unquote, furniture. The suits of family armour of all periods, and not all fake, stand idly round. It is the room in which the dukes have died, quote, breathing the breath of page or groom, unquote, since all time. Like the father of Browning's corrupt hero, quote, in a velvet suit with a gilt glove on his hand and his foot in a silken shoe for a leather boot, petticoated like a herald. Unquote. He probably had gout, which is not at all a modern disease, and his descendant, the fainéant hero of the poem, though quote, corrupted with foreign travel, unquote, Paris and so on, harks back and yearns towards the customs of his ancestors. So he starts in to, quote, revive all usages, though worn out, unquote, and hunts up old books to find out the way, among other customs of a hunting party, as practised in the Middle Ages. He, quote, gathers up Woodcraft's authentic traditions to encourage your dog now, the properest chirrup or best prayer to St. Hubert on mounting your stirrup, unquote. The Duke's tale, of quote, has a hot time on't, unquote. And finally, the haughty little Duchess, quote, no bigger than a white crane, unquote, has her proper function discovered for her. Quote, when horns wind a mort, and the deer is at siege, let the dame of the castle prick forth on her jennet, and with water to wash the hands of her liege in a clean ewer with a fair toweling let her preside at the disembowelling the duchess refuses and the duke turns the recalcitrant wife over to his august and terrible mother riding out of the courtyard on his way to conduct the ceremony alone he meets the usual band of gypsies who wish him luck with low cunning he sends the gypsy queen into the house to teach his bride her duty. The result is contrary to his expectation. It gives Browning a fine opportunity for a tirade, the opportunity of using some queer recondite knowledge he seems to have possessed about this mysterious race, and to disclose a genuine sympathy and understanding of their genius. He uses it again in the story of the Pied Piper of Hamelin, now, says the old German body servant who's supposed to be Browning's informant of these doings, quote, In your land, gypsies reach you only after reaching all lands beside. North they go, south they go, trooping or lonely, and still as they travel far and wide, catch they and keep they a trace here, a trace there, that puts you in mind of a place here, a place there. But with us... I believe they rise out of the ground, unquote. With us, that is in Germany, and according to Browning, just in the same sudden way did the wonderful piper erupt into the Rathaus at Hamelin, where the fat, self-sufficient burgomasters sat and sat and deliberated over their deadly need. At the door comes in the, quote, gentle tap, and in he wanders, the legendary figure, the model of all wandering sages and nomadic geniuses, Gringoire, Pierre Gint, Shelley, the scholar Gypsy. Quote, his queer long coat from heel to head was half of yellow and half of red, and he himself was tall and thin, with sharp blue eyes, each like a pin, 
and light loose hair yet a swarthy skin no tuft on cheek nor beard on chin but lips where smiles went out and in there was no guessing his kith and kin unquote. the pied piper was only another gypsy as the gypsy crone who bewitched the duchess irresponsible kind capricious and revengeful and endowed with those mysterious powers of the single-minded and single-hearted of all nations powers which the enforced franciscan virtues of the beggar the rover the proscribed served to develop in the old days i imagine romance stalked the lonely roads and dangerous highways incorporated in figures like these derelicts of man's injustice or intellects before their time wandering into smug german dwarfs and english villages by way of tartary and asia men of roving unconquerable dispositions fortified and embittered perhaps by some deep sense of injustice and carrying in their breasts a secret bond made with themselves to work out a revenge on the society that has misused them the gypsy crone slavishly promises to give the lady a thorough good frightening but once her sympathies are engaged she betrays the injurious taskmaster and goes off on her own tack in the lady's presence quote, her ignoble mien was wholly altered she shot up a full head in stature ellipsis as if age had foregone its usurpature unquote. she declaims quote, and so at last we find my tribe and so i set thee in the midst i trace them the vein and the other vein that meet on thy brow and part again making our rapid mystic mark and then as mid the dark a gleam of yet another morning breaks and like the hand which ends the dream death like the might of his sunbeam touches the flesh and the soul awakes then unquote. ah then the gypsy has bewitched the duchess and away they go together and that other gypsy the pied piper defrauded of his just wages for the extermination of the plague of rats by the parsimonious town council what is his wild cruel and irresponsible revenge the revenge of a wild untutored unchastened being half animal half human Quote, once more he stepped into the street and to his lips again laid his long pipe of smooth straight cane and ere he blew three notes such sweet soft notes as yet musicians cunning never gave the enraptured air unquote. and followed by all their sons and daughters he turned not as in the case of the rats to where quote, the vaser rolled its waters but to the Koppelberg hill which opened and swallowed all the youth of hamelin but one unquote. i suppose he relented being after all an artist and half human as these persons who live in our dull sensible mediocrity generally are let the world thank god for them these moral lynch lawyers who take upon themselves to execute poetic justice and teach us in the crabbed words of the artist who invented the hero of the hamlin legend to quote, be wipers of scores out of all men especially pipers unquote. the word pipers standing for precisely the kind of irresponsible being whom if he is a musician we invite into our houses to make music for us and decline to pay or the man who writes the books we read with avidity while allowing the author who cannot choose but write to starve in a garret browning had german blood in him on his mother's side and spent a good deal of his youth in germany of course he visited hamelin in the thirties was the legend of the Pied Piper already a full-blown commercial asset? Or did he give it its value on that side? When he walked along, as we did, from the railway station to, quote, 
Hamlin town by famous Hanover city, did he look into the shop windows all the way he went, full of every conceivable form of exploitation of the legend? Rat pen wipers, gingerbread rats with beady currant eyes, picture postcards representing the scene with a pied piper, singularly like Mr. F. R. Benson, followed either by his rabble of rats or troop of beautiful eager children. Did he come to the very rat house where the ignoble civic body of Hamlin deliberated, and on to where the Vesa rolls, spanned now by a modern bridge, studded with craft and with great coaling barges moored under its banks? Surely somewhere in the distance is the Koppelberg Hill, in whose sides the mysterious portal opened to rake in its living tribute. Alas, alas for Hamlin. End of section 14section fifteen of the desirable alien at home in germany by violet hunt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen great danes geese mice and schoolmasters germany is the land of great danes i wanted a dog i had lost two a bulldog and a bull terrier and i settled that the third should be a great dane Every student in Marburg, so Joseph Leopold says, likes to swagger into a restaurant, swinging his great stick and followed by his great Dane, who lies down at his feet and takes notice of nobody else. It is just swagger, not sonophilism, for as soon as the bald-headed one does what in England would be called going down, he trades off the companion of his rambles and orgies to another student, who has just come up but there is a certain regular demand for great danes in marburg and jena and bonn so great danes are being raised to meet this demand all over the circumambient country we picked out a village from which to select a dog looking over the rampart of the castle of marburg we chose a little spot of red with indeterminate edges that dotted the soft green plain lying spread out flat at our feet it happened to be the village of kappel and joseph leopold confidently informed me that we should find a dog there for sale at something like four pounds or perhaps even three although you have cleverly singled out a place from the bird's eye view of it it is not so easy to go straight there when once you have descended to the same level though it is a fact that in germany you never have any excuse for not knowing your duty or your place if france is le pays du tendre germany is the country of the precise direction every signpost bears the names writ large and clear of numberless villages and we struck the road to kappel at once we were walking along in the broad valley of the lahn the hills clothed in green rose languidly around us at a little distance it was all arranged like some form of expensive landscape gardening on a large calm scale the absence of hedges gives this quiet premeditated effect you get stretches of soft rich meadowland and the feet of the hills drowned in sedges rising from beds of yellow colza or red sainfoin and purple clover in front of us was the frauenberg that hill of mystic rites it is crowned by an old prehistoric earthwork and the ruins of a more modern castle behind us was the wilhelmshoe facing marburg with the modern imitation gothic tower on it that positively overlooks the towers of the elizabethan kirche and one saw to right and left and in front the roads parting the forest masses laid wide and ready for the kaiserliche postcards that scour his imperial highness's dominions spreading the light of intelligence through the woodland silences without abating one jot of these people's highly educated simplicity 
the vessel of the spirit is generally as to pattern an old very old berlin very like the one in which the unfortunate bourbon family went to varennes its small windows are always kept tightly closed the little varnished kutscher like a woodland sprite sits on the box and drives for hours from one village or from one forester's hut to another he suggests varnish because of his dome-shaped casquette that shines like black carriage cloth and has the immutable fixed aigrette in the front of it as an assertion of kaiserliche authority there is seldom room for anyone beside him but if you are prepared to rough it and sit inside in the berlin stuffiness that is the way to get about the country the kaiserliche post penetrates everywhere where no trains and hardly any foot passengers ever go right into the swart heart of the teutobeger wald and that mysterious eiffel range that hangs over the left bank of the rhine and is full of wonderments witches and warlocks quite the most innocent persons you are likely to see in these wälder are charcoal burners the very poor charcoal burners that form the greater number of the characters of grim stories with their wonderful seventh sons and their little rush lights burning in cottage windows as a refuge for stray travellers sometimes the only posting house is a forsterei and there you can generally put up for the night if you like and sample the roughest and the wholesomest affairs the forster is sometimes nay generally a great swell and you cap him and tug him politely when you meet him with his dog and his gun walking briskly through lonely glades and clearings he wears what always looks like a completely new suit of light grey with blue or green facings and a soft grey felt hat with a cock's feather stuck in the band it is his plain brown wife i suppose who entertains you for a few fennigs under her wooden veranda gives you beer or coffee and even a plate of soup on one of the tiny little tables covered with the red checked cloth dear to germany her husband is good company if you like and his stories have the peculiar wildness and invraisemblance of stories told by one who does not very often have an opportunity of exchanging ideas and ventilating his experiences over a glass with his brother man but although these dense woods lined our horizon we were walking along on the flat dusty road with the tamest of apple trees bordering it as we stepped out a dwarf grew appreciably nearer presently we began to meet the troops of geese and the attendant goose girl that furnishes the feminine element in grim paddling along the muddy road and as we got still nearer to the village we saw that the geese were at home they were not walking but standing about in front of their cottage doors so to speak crouching down beside open gateways and if they did not actually cackle looking ready to stick their necks across the road and bar our passage i have ceased to be afraid of geese and to feel instinctively the calves of my legs tingling as i approach the treacherous white-breasted things with their cruel yellow beak nestling in the innocent seeming down but i have left off being civil to them and addressing a kind word to them as i pass they never respond a well-nurtured dog or cat or even a donkey at times will do so but their breeds are something wild and untamed in the breast of a goose before it is fattened at any rate it is rebabatif farouche gauche i like to use french words about a german goose it has possibly its civic duties to attend to it is either the sentinel goose to which you happen to address your remarks and of course he is busy or it is the lovely young goose that all the others are chaperoning a goose's politeness is passive if you are very unobtrusive the whole lot will remain sitting as you pass instead of rising with a quack and the effect of a universal curtsy such passivity and as it were ignoring of you as part of the landscape is the greatest sign of confidence 
that a goose can give. Children, equally farouche but less fierce-looking, begin to potter about under your feet as you get nearer the heart of the village. In Germany the children, with their slates and satchels, seem to me to be always coming in droves out of school, just like English ones. They all look very pretty. Most of them wear costumes. A child's costume is just like that of its elders, but in miniature. The baby of five has as many rows of trimming on her skirt as her mother, only justly proportioned to her tininess. They suggest a general affluence, these gorgeous and variegated garments of the population, which is contradicted by the tumble-down, decrepit appearance of the abodes from which they pour. So much straw litter is heaped, pulled out and lying about. Opulent, slushy middens rank as foreground object. Nondescript washing is stretched over fences or the threshold bush or vine. And yet the row of grey-green jugs, transfixed bottom upwards on the spikes of the paling, and the household vessels placed on the steps, each rinsed out, efficaciously shining with cleanness, bear witness to the Hausfrau's real notability. And in the worst little house of all, with a wide midden of mud and garbage fronting it, as ill for the feet polite to cross as the Red Sea of the Israelites, chained to a rudimentary kennel between a tumble-down barn and this vast, this prehistoric-looking fumier, was a brindled darling, a perfect darling. If someone had offered to roll the Red Sea of dung away for me to cross, I should not have had the patience to wait, or the prudence to go round it. I don't know how it happened, but in a few seconds I was there, and my arm on the puissant neck of the great Dane of my dreams. Though he was chained, he was gentle, sad, and very thin. I began at once to think of the kennels at Charlton and the pier at Dover, where in preparation for an enforced quarantine of six months, I should be obliged to land him in a wooden box or crate, which would quite conceal him from view, and hand him over crate and all to a chartered official from the government kennels. He would cost me first and last, in including the initial three, quite thirteen pounds. I should not have the training of him, and he would probably never learn to love me. But no matter, I was determined to have him. However, Joseph Leopold, who had seen many Great Danes and intended to be diplomatic about the purchase of this one, for he saw my determination written large on my face, suggested that we should eat first before entering into negotiations with the landlord of the inn. This was an inn. I had never before seen an inn like this. Joseph Leopold remarked that there were inns in the Spessart that he could tell me of where fowls slept in the room with you, inns that were moreover in the nature of a poorhouse, so that if you had fared far and had at last succeeded in chartering a night's lodging, you might be turned out at the government behest, if a deserving beggar should turn up and demand his right and his due, a night's lodging at the hands of his country. This is quite the roughest inn you personally have struck, he admitted. Still, you won't mind what you eat here, if you end by getting the dog for three pounds, that is, if he is for sale. For we did not even know that yet, though it seemed probable. I agreed. We did not go inside, for the Stube seemed to be reeking of smoke, though fairly clean. There was a sort of lean-to built against the wall of the house, and a thin, haggard menagere came forward and seemed to ask what she could do for us. Was kann man zu essen bekommen? Joseph Leopold used his usual negligent formula. She mentioned some comestible whose name left Joseph Leopold cold, but apparently it was all there was, and presently she served it. It was Brötchen mit Butter, Bier and Handkäse. The bread was delicious, the butter good, but the cheese made by hand. 
imagine a piece of yellow soap that you have left by accident in the water in the bathroom imagine yourself taking it out in despair from the bottom of the basin where it has stuck and nipping it frantically in the process then you will realize what hand case is it has indeed been well squeezed as its name denotes in the palm of a large persuasive hand well used to the duty the inside remains hard only the outside softens a little and a few hours after a slight disgusting sort of skin forms on the soft surface you cut into it and find all these layers of hardness and softness with a few dejected caraway seeds drifting about here and there you eat it and it is of varying degrees of sourness and consistency unlike the curate's egg none of it is bad but not one square inch tasting like the other very nice i encouraged joseph leopold and now let us go out and look at the dog the landlord a hard-featured dull-voiced oppressed-looking peasant came out and spoke kindly to the beautiful depressed animal at his master's behest it relaxed its sad patient austerity and licked my hand it licked it to order the hand of a potential owner passionlessly automatically what struck me so strongly about master and dog was their respectable inanity the vacant good temper of both then the chain was undone and the dog was allowed to run about to testify to his powers of locomotion round and round the midden he went in a sort of dignified lope gathering his haunches suavely and surely beneath him to produce that beautiful easy resilient stride proper to the dane see he can run the master said he is quite young he would go better only i cannot afford to feed him on meat he spoke spiritlessly the dog ran spiritlessly that was it without being actually starved they neither of them had enough to eat footnote this and the whole subsequent passage about the german agricultural population represent without doubt an impressionistic frame of mind on the part of an author but the conversation with myself is the purest nonsense as well as being the sheerest invention the innkeeper here represented as being spiritless was a wealthy peasant worth at least five hundred a year in english money his inn being patronized by students from the neighboring city whose taste for walking would not carry them any further than what i would call a middle distance this gentleman could not afford to give the dog meat to eat because with him dog breeding was a serious business his determination being to make a profit of at least four hundred per cent on any outlay upon the animal in question the peasants of this part of the world are generally suspicious obstinate and litigious but they are above all things wealthy they own their own lands they quarrel violently about their boundary stones they rise in open rebellion if the state attempts changes on their territory even though that redistribution may be for their benefit the state giving them small fertile fields near their house in exchange for a stony acre six miles away in the mountains their suspicious nature is typified by the fact that if you ask one of these peasants the way to the next village he will reply i'm not denying that you take the second turning on the right it is still further exemplified by the crowds of jews that are to be found all through hesher the hessian peasant detests a jew but he much more distrusts his neighbour so that if peasant schmidt desires to sell a cow to peasant braun he will sell it first to cow agent isaacstein and isaacstein will afterwards sell it to the other peasant there are of course tenant farmers in germany who are poor but i should say that upon the whole the german peasant is much better off than the english farmer and the state more particularly the prussian state 
does all that it possibly can to foster agrarian prosperity the prices of agricultural produce are exceedingly high all over germany no internal taxes of any kind are put upon nahrungsmittel food products produced within the german empire and protection for these articles is very high and rigidly enforced the german farmer in certain cases does not live as well as the english one when this is the case it is because he is more provident on weekdays preferring to be ostentatious at feasts he practically never has a parlour nottingham lace curtains are unknown to him and wax flowers under glass shades he may not have a piano but if he has one he plays upon it himself and it is not purchased on the higher system he is in fact a peasant frequently a very rich peasant sometimes a quite poor one but never in his habits his dress or his ambitions a snobbish imitation of the gentry i am of course talking of the peasant proprietor and not of his employé the shepherd the swineherd and the tagelohner the day labourers generally are very poorly paid the furnishings of their huts would cause an english wagoner's mate to experience a sensation of sickness and as for their diet it consists almost entirely of potatoes and maize with an occasional flavouring of bacon but in the nature of the case there are far fewer employed agricultural labourers in germany than there are in england j l f m h end footnote the man hoped to have a little more to eat when he had sold the dog as he was sure he would do for sixty marks the dog if he thought at all probably expected in his doggy way to be better fed when he was bought by some happy-go-lucky lavish student or other we did not buy the dog i cannot now think why i dream of that dog at kappel sometimes it has become a ghostly dog to me not that i think it was starved to death i am sure it was bought and lived its doggy span but it got mixed up with my sick thoughts in an illness i contracted in the course of the next few weeks and as i lay in my bed at marburg i thought of the day when i should be well and able to go down and across the plain again and buy that dog and feed it up till it could run better and still better i would not allow joseph leopold to go and buy it for me i meant to buy it myself as soon as i got well it was my dog i dreamt of it every night and when i was well enough to travel i was hustled away and nobody remembered the brindled dog i had talked about it in my ravings and desired to take it to england and get my mother to feed it until it could run as we walked home to marburg that evening joseph leopold in answer to my question do you suppose he feeds him replied he feeds him as well as he feeds himself these german peasants are mildly poor but not abjectly so they are kept by their paternal government at a dead level of mediocre efficiency of health it is only in england that the farmers are really what you call prosperous all farmers come to grief in england i said sooner or later now and then but they cannot say they haven't had a good run for their money these unfortunate germans are dully glumly conscious that they are all in the hollow of the large paternal indiscriminating hand he shall not suffer one sparrow to fall etc but if the sparrow has no joie de vivre no fun what does it matter if he keeps up or not english farming is one big gamble with all the excitement of gambling then the german peasant i said to show that i understood knows that he can't come to grief but he knows also that he can't come to pleasure exactly we went back through the paternally tended village and i felt differently about it there were the uncircumscribed middens and the bulging heaps of fodder 
blanking all the little white painted faintly derelict houses having the aspect of a decaying tooth and i thought of the large iron hand i thought of an illustration in an old story-book of gulliver of the helpless lilliputians huddled into the big enclosing brobdignagian palm of some kaiser or other we picked our way along the broad highway avoiding the deep ruts in which the water of three days showers ran while the white geese with their underparts smirched brooded in the furrows and the dressed-up children paddled in and out we passed again the rows of house-pots grey with the soft grey of a persian cat perched like hats on the fences and we emerged onto the broad unfenced road with the fields lying close up to it and punctuated by a scraggy apple tree dotted at rare intervals the towers of marburg surged dimly up out of a haze of dampness in the distance but i had not got the dog we passed something very black presently a schoolmaster convoying a little flock of pupils they seemed much occupied in poking sticks into mud holes in the stubble fields that marched with the road the schoolmaster industriously indicated these holes to them with the ferrule of his umbrella what are these children doing i asked idly i was tired and annoyed with germany is he giving them an agricultural object lesson no they're not learning they are practising agriculture they are eradicating mice killing them do you mean and the schoolmaster showing the little wretches how i shrieked the mice are ruining the crops joseph leopold said mildly these rodents are very noxious i remember last year at g -dash, there was a plague of mice you could not walk in the fields without putting your foot on them he mourned it on about the damage done by these pretty little creatures yes i have seen even a rat that was pretty and anyway it is a dumb animal i was so annoyed with germany as i said before that i walked on in a resentful silence to see a schoolmaster instead of acting as he should have done in the interests of humanity actually inciting his class to deeds of cruelty was too much for the traces of british feeling that yet lingered in my alien breast and then it was saturday evening the german church bells began to ring in sunday as is their custom i hate church bells as much as the devil is said to do and now i hate german schoolmasters i thought of another german custom which i had heard hinted at and it was connected with mice so i took it up as a stick to hit a german with i suppose cats do the dirty work in england i said but i never seem to see a cat in germany plenty of kittens but no cats i suppose you eat them as soon as they are fat enough something in that joseph leopold remarked cruelly but the real reason is that they eat the birds germans love birds and would sooner have an aviary than a cattery like yours i am a german and i love birds i got back to marburg without a dog and with several illusions the less about germans and about joseph leopold in particular but when joseph leopold referred to his stay in g -dash, i remembered an anecdote which a learned friend of his a professor in the said town once related to me joseph leopold's sentimental vagary amused and interested the professor and i set it against his callousness with regard to mice and cats everyone knows that reifleisch is the housekeeper's best asset in germany and her english sister who sighs so pathetically for a new beast is emphatically the poorer in culinary invention because the english butcher takes so little definite cognizance of the animal that pants in vain but in g -dash, deer are caught and brought in alive from the neighbouring forest placed in some improvised pen and fattened 
clients of a favourite eating place may see and inspect their meal of a month hence increasing behind his wattled prison children may poke the poor thing with their sticks prod him and throw him mock food to eat stare and gibe at the patient misery of the wild creature prisoned in an enclosing cage where he may not evade their persecution but only lie down and await his doom one day when the right amount of adipose tissue has deposited itself on his bones the wind pipe is slit and the table of mine host of the golden anchor knows the rest it is true that if one allows such fine feelings to sway one one must leave off eating ray and joseph leopold likes ray and eats it whenever he can get it but the sight of the means to the end is repellent to him each prod of a passenger's umbrella at the deer of g dash each stupid onslaught on the creature's temporary peace went to his heart it would have gone to mine and when later on he confessed to the incident half in shame half in pride i admitted that he could have taken no other course he approached the inn people and asked if he might be permitted to purchase the deer alive they naturally agreed at once a price was fixed three pounds ten and joseph leopold took his grey hired a cart and placed the bemused and recalcitrant beast in it behold the philanthropist driving off jubilantly to the forest across a couple of fields or so until he comes with his prey to a clear space where the dead leaves are not so thick and the low boughs hold away a little then he releases the frightened scared thing and watches it bound away to the forest one hoped it lived happily ever after to the natural term of a rhodia's life but would its friends be kind to it would its limbs be as nimble after their long spell of restraint would it not get caught again and eaten did joseph leopold himself eat it after all there is no knowing but the peace that passeth understanding must have been his as he watched the deer bound away into the open such a thing can never have happened before in all the annals of deerdom and as the german hair professor who first told me the tale said the inn people were no losers and promptly supplied themselves with a fresh deer joseph leopold did not know this for natural modesty kept the hero of such a virtuous and unworldly action at a distance from the scene of his exploit. End of section 15section 16 of the desirable alien at home in germany by violet hunt this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 15 drizzling and officers castle adequately represents germany of the 18th century to look out on that wide platz with the royal residence on one side a castle on the other a glacis on the third and a statue of a royal duke in the middle is to think of banner screens and berlin woolwork and tight stays and etiquette and carolina bauer and the tragedy of drizzling very few people know anything about drizzling but they all know something about the beautiful actress carolina bauer who persuaded her uncle stiff old general bauer of castle to let her go on the stage and she was very like princess charlotte of england the dead spouse of prince leopold of saxe coburg the prince most morose handsomest man of his age was a confirmed drizzler and pretty carolina had played when a child with him her cousin christian stockmar managed the prince of coburg and later through the respect which the prince consort had for him he exercised a very considerable influence over the court and policy of the late queen victoria of england he was a managing man and he managed his niece's affairs for her very badly if we are to believe 
the statements made in that vivacious lady's memoirs. Trading upon the chance likeness of the young actress to the dead Charlotte of Wales, he engineered a love affair and persuaded Caroline Bauer to come to England in the hope of becoming the stony but broken-hearted Leopold's morganatic wife. Poor Carolina and her good mother, en tout bien, tout honneur, were planted out in a villa in the Regent's Park, and Prince Leopold went to tea with them and drizzled. And the drizzling was the worst part of it for Carolina to bear, and her chafing under it would have lost her her place if the prospect of the Greek throne had not done so more effectually. After a year's suspense in England, when the drizzler's visits were all the amusement she had, she was ignominiously packed back to Coburg as Countess Montgomery, and her memoirs say, quote, worse than hang of all the German-English royalties. Drizzling was invented in France by the fair bored ones of Versailles, and they called it Puffilage. They begged their male friends for gold and silver epaulets, hilt bands, galloons and tassels, so that a lover in those days, to make himself agreeable, would rob himself prematurely of the chief ornaments of his wardrobe and present them to the lady. She would put them all into a huge picking bag and take them to court for she was proudest, whose bag ran over with the best gold. Bets between the sexes were settled not in hard cash, but in so many gold tassels for picking. Madame de Jolie took credit with herself for having put a stop to this traffic in galloons and lace. Since Adele and Theodore, she says, no lady has been seen in society demanding gold for picking from a man. The ladies of France went back to embroidery. Quote, the needlework which had once agreeably whiled away the time of our mothers and grandmothers, unquote. And Parfilage crossed over to England, where it was called Drizzling. Carolina Bauer's lover was royal, and therefore prone to the royal disorder of ennui. He combated it by drizzling, to the intense vexation of the sprightly Carolina, to see the prince alight from his carriage, followed by his groom bearing the, quote, awful drizzling box made of tortoiseshell, unquote, without yawning in his face, to sit beside him while he, quote, drizzled with monotonous regularity, unquote, made her inclined to run away without waiting for the prince to declare himself and thus defeat all the best laid schemes of cousin Christian. But she, quote, sat tight, unquote, and lost him after all. Then Berlin Woolwork came in and drove all before it, even drizzling. It killed all artistic needlework in England till the establishment of the firm of Morris and Company, but it probably was just as efficacious by way of a thought annihilator as any other form of occupation, and there is no doubt that it sorted with the inferior art instinct of that generation. Taught as a little girl by my astute nurse to make an entire wardrobe for the doll I cherished, nude as it came from the godmother, I did not realise at that time that I was laying up balm in Gilead, a panacea for my middle age, and as the keeping of a diary is advised by way of inculcating unconscious habits of composition, so my nurse's insistence on an irksome degree of proficiency gained me that mechanical skill which enables me to give but the very slightest attention to the coloured worsted that blocks out a leaf or the seam that unrolls itself steadily from the pin fixing it to the knee. If only half a mind is left, the other half is not much good to worry with. A certain adjustment of the proportions only is needed to render one process void and the other useful. Of course, the work must be a little better than the perfunctory night sewing of an actress on Seine, 
that is only fit like penelope's to be unravelled again by day though i am credibly informed that some of our leading ladies hem all their household linen during the run of a successful piece as i am never or hardly ever to be seen without a piece of useful needlework in my hand what i am going to say will inevitably suggest that i possess a character of the most restless the most pernickety i sew that i may not weep or rather worry other people smoke or play patience to promote their powers of abstention from a process as undesirable as it is futile but from all ages i fancy this principle has been conceded that it is good to withdraw even so much as a fraction of one's attention from whatever represents the prevailing form of obsession an obsession that requires concentration to intensify it it gets it all the boring drilling force of intellect focused on an annoyance unless some such panacea as has been the heritage of all the ages is resorted to the egyptians possessed playing cards they probably played patiences in their mansions on the broiling sand greek women spun and we know the medieval ladies embroidered quote, sitting lily-like a row unquote. the bayeux tapestry probably represents the nerve outlet of matilda the wife of the conqueror and of all the wives of his ragamuffin host left at home in normandy to worry over the results of the great coup and bid for landed property what of mary queen of scots needlework which is always turning up in exhibitions and a large piece of which is still shown among the arid stonework of a temporary abode of hers edinburgh castle women who sew are generally good-tempered and i can point to instances of great intellects among my sex who have not scorned the innocent derivative of a confessedly feminine occupation i can mention three women authors who were notoriously nimble with their fingers and one of them george eliot to my knowledge gave some umbrage to a distinguished male visitor who called and found her as her custom was engaged on a piece of ugly uninteresting white work was she stitching shirt bands for the late george henry lewis that this other literary magnate felt and expressed such irritation to me years afterwards charlotte bronte too was a fine needlewoman though i do not think she embroidered she probably made lace collarettes as my own mother did when sewing in company georges sand was another example of the woman of genius who realizes the immense use of a mechanical non-fatiguing occupation as a thought killer but then she smoked as well the best instance is that of the greatest woman of all joan of arc in her trial was once and once only stung into the expression of a personal and domestic point of pride oh as far as sewing and spinning goes i give way to no woman in rouen she said and even the monkish chroniclers of the courthouse have not been able to take the innocent vanity out of the phrase from castle one goes to see wilhelm's her and i wonder if i shall be sent to glatz or spandau if like lieutenant bilse i venture to put on paper what i think about wilhelm's hoa because i think it is without exception the ugliest place i ever saw the most elaborately tasteless the crudest in bad prevailing colour my impressions of it began to be planted at the bend of the line going to castle where it slewed round and let me see in the distance a pretentious mock ruin on the crest of the hill it was not the ruin of a castle it was the elaborate structure of the hercules cascade even from that distance i could discern the artificially chopped stones disposed in tiers like the worst strawberry hill gothic and of very large proportions 
and that is, I suppose, why the erection as a whole is called after Hercules. The palace, I was told, lay in the hollow below, between the cascade and the railway station. It has a station all to itself, where sovereigns, regnant and deposed both, must alight. Napoleon the Third, after Sedan, was forced to drag his weary, disease-ridden body there. Somewhere on the road between Sedan and here is the little posting-house where he lay all night and read in bed to try and procure sleep. Archibald Forbes told me what it was he was reading, a novel of Bulwer's, The Last of the Barons. And Forbes, in his capacity of war correspondent, was there when the Emperor gave up his sword to the old, severe, but by no means brutal, Moltke. It was a sad mess. The people who shouted, A Berlin, so frantically, were in the first place not ready, and in the second, cruelly done by their army fournisseur. Joseph Leopold pointed out to me the hill that the Emperor stood on that day, and sadly putting his field glass back in its sheath, admitted that he had lost the field through bad guns, bad boots, and want of discipline. Said on field is as tame as Edge Hill, where a Stuart lost his chance, or Neville's cross on the red hills near Durham, that once ran with blood. Sedan Field is more riant, perhaps, than either of these. I don't think I ever realised the bitterness of the Emperor's Cup till I saw the scene of his fall in this quiet plain, so far from palpitating Paris, where wife and child, his hostages, were sheltered only by the success of his eagles, and there among these tame sedges, the eagles declined, and the emperor folded up his glasses and knew full well what would be the next move. Wilhelmshauer and its hideous, tasteless magnificence, and old Wilhelm's sardonic deference. There are carp in the lake at Wilhelmshauer, but Napoleon de Petit had never lived at Versailles to be agreeably reminded of it at Wilhelmshauer. And there are gardens at Wilhelmshauer, a profusion of aniline dyed flowers set out in flat mathematical beds like table decorations, and window boxes fit to tear your eyes out. The sick man recked little of that. I imagine him lying there wondering, à quelle sauce il serait mangé? We saw the very bed on which he lay in the empire decorated suite of rooms allotted by the old king to his distinguished guest. That was a matter of custodians and tips and felt slippers. Yes, before we were allowed to set foot in the state apartments, Joseph Leopold and I, in a miscellaneous collection of tourists, chiefly women, were asked to put on felt slippers, nominally to prevent us from slipping on the highly polished parquets but I am sure it was to avert the possible damage that our dirty, clumsy boots might entail. I say slippers, but these objects, flung at us out of a cupboard near the entry in a contemptuous manner by the custodian, were more like boats, more like arks, and I should have found it impossible to walk in them. I said so, and with a look at my clodhoppers, which beside those of the other two German women's, had the effect of what English shoemakers would have called smart shoes, that is to say, delicate and refined to a point. The custodian tacitly agreed that such fairy footsteps as mine could do no damage, and invited me to proceed unshod in the felt boats. After we had seen the Napoleon suite, and the suite which the Kaiser inhabits with his family when he comes down to feast his eyes on his red and yellow flowers, we got out of the palace again and went to look at the carp and to send off picture postcards from the great post office which the Kaiser maintains in the grounds. And then it began to rain and we decided to mount to the cascade. At close quarters, 
the Hercules cascade resembles a huge sugar cake, or one of the epernes that in Thackeray's day used to be placed in the centre of the table to prevent husbands and wives seeing each other. This ghastly erection fills up the whole of the prospect and horribly interrupts the skyline. It is the only thing one sees from the windows of the Napoleon suite, macabre and cheerless. It cannot have induced any more pleasant thoughts than those that the son of Hortense had any right to. We went back to Castle and the land of casernes and offices, and upon my word Castle seemed almost picturesque after the palace of the German Caesars. The sky was a cold, steely blue. We heard the clickety of arms as we approached the barracks. Looking over a wall from the top of the tram, we saw the privates washing their linen. It was late in the year, and those heralds of autumn, the reservists, were coming back. So they say in Germany, while summer is shown in by the appearance of my bowler on people's tables and placarded on the signs of Gastwirtschaften. I like my bowler, but I rather hate soldiers. And above all, Prussian officers, and there are many at Kassel. I was really afraid of German officers till I knew Herr W. He is a friend of Joseph Leopold's, and on the morning of my arrival in my house in H dash, I looked out of the window and saw a fat officer on a fat white horse, bowing and prancing and paying his respects. He was an engineer as well. I don't really understand how a man can be both an officer and the head of a railway line, but in Germany it appears he can monopolize these two very onerous offices. And Herr W is heavy but polite. In Wiesbaden, I had met officers in the Allee as free to me as to them, or so I had thought, and they had literally forced me to give them the power under pain of being knocked down. There is nothing in the world like the aggressiveness of a Prussian officer. And I had seen them when I had been staying in garrison towns at hotels where they habitually dine or sup. But does anyone suppose that they condescend to sit down with the rest of us? No, noisily and consciously, they swagger through the common Speisesaal into a special Saal reserved for them, a holy of holies to where the best dishes are carried in first. Footnote. I do not know how our author penetrated into the psychologies of these gentlemen, so as to know whether they were conscious or not. But in most hotels of the civilised world, the regular guests of those hotels, whether they be cabinet ministers or bagmen, are given regular tables, or, supposing the company to be sufficient to warrant it, a separate room. So it was with the officers whom our author has seen. J. L. F. M. H. End footnote. And if by chance a poor little common soldier happens to be eating his humble meal along with us in the common dining room, he has hastily to swallow the mouthful he has just taken into his mouth, stand up and click his heels together, remaining in that humiliating position until his brilliant superior has passed by. I have seen a poor little peon rise at least a dozen times in the course of one meal to the unspoken hest of a brilliant being with floating cloak and with ringing spurs who comes bumptiously clashing in. Footnote. This would be precisely the same in England if a private soldier in uniform happened to be eating in a restaurant when an officer in uniform entered. English officers in uniform are not allowed to travel in public conveyances or in any class but first class on railways, because if a private soldier happened to be in the same compartment, the private soldier would have to remain on his feet during the journey. The same reasonable regulation obtains in Germany. J. L. F. M. H. End footnote. I do not care for the horrid little jimp, skimp, ill-made grey ulsters that the Einjeriger wear, 
but I deeply admire the flamboyant cloak of grey with blue Gerard collar and gold military braid worn by officers. I admired them so much that I suggested to Joseph Leopold that he should have a cloak made like them. Borrow that of his friend Lieutenant von L, for whom I had once done some slight service in introducing him to a young lady he happened to admire at Nauheim. To where, when you take me out to tea on Camden Hill? Joseph Leopold inquired. I explained that it would not be so much for Camden Hill as for travelling about in our native country. And he replied that he would rather not be arrested. All these rude, handsome men were, of course, alike to me, but by the fashion of their garments, Joseph Leopold seemed to know to which corps they belonged. In Trier, a frontier town, officers are paramount. I mean, they infest every walk of life. You go for a walk to some distant beer garden, and there you see all these gay uniforms sitting with plain women at little tables on the rough grass, looking much too smart in their gold galloon and blue cloth for their ill-dressed females. And all along the wooded hills above Trier you stop to take breath, and there comes to you the rubber dub of the conscripts practising. It is an ordinance that they may not do so any nearer town than a mile. Footnote. These gentlemen are not conscripts, and what I wrote the means is that when a regimental band is practising a new piece of music, or new recruits are trying their hand at bugle calls, they are requested to retire to some distance from the town. This practice prevails in most civilised countries. I remember getting great pleasure outside the city of Tarascon, hearing a regimental band of chasseurs practising in an abandoned graveyard, an excerpt from Die Valkyrie. J. L. F. M. H. End footnote. In frontier towns, one always feels in the air the unrest, the indecisions of a population standing on debatable ground. During the war scare of 1910, 84,000 men were quartered in Trier. The men were perforce billeted in all the houses. The citizens did not mind that, for daughters went off marvellously during this pacific occupation. End of section 16《Desirable Alien at Home in Germany》by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 How It Feels to Be Members of Subject Races by Ford Maddox Hepper. Down below, at the bottom of the hill with the many barrows, a dog barked unceasingly. It is absurd the amount of colour they get into these German landscapes. It is almost as if nature had gone mad. The only thing that beneath the hot sun was sober was the bit of hilltop with the barrows where we lay. The hill might have been a little piece of an English down, dun coloured, irregular, and quarried again and again, but the ploughed land that came up to our feet was reddish in the highlights and purplish in the shadow. The boughs of the apple trees, absurdly thick with an aqueous blossom, pushed themselves wildly up at the blue sky between the scarlet roofs of the houses that were whitewashed and then painted between their black timbers with bouquets of flowers, stags or pious, joyous, complacent or defiant verses. One of these verses, as we had come up through the village, we had observed to run, God helped me to build this house. If you mock at its appearance, you will not hurt me, for with the aid of God I built it to please myself. And lying one day on just this range of hills, an old Landgraf Heinrich, eight hundred years ago, made up this verse. There is no place so pleasant as this valley that I look upon, for it has a river that is beloved, good hunting, pleasant woods, fine hills, and excellent feeding. 
as well as many apple trees and songbirds. And triumphantly he adds, und dat ich mein, und that I think, and that is mine. He must have been a fine old man, and all that he said of his valley, which contains still the beloved river line, all that he said is true. The dog continued to bark incessantly, 240 little sharp barks to the minute, and then suddenly it came into our heads to observe that the creature was standing planted just outside its hedge and barking at us. We lay quite still. The dog stood perfectly still and barked. It seemed to resemble the result of several crosses between a rat, a rabbit and a wire-haired terrier. But it was so far down the hill that the sharp notes of its voice were no more disturbing than the rustle of wind in the false sprint grass on the barrows. And suddenly again it came into our heads to wonder whose territory the dog with such a querulous valiance was defending against us people who lay among the forgotten dead. We could not say without looking at a map whether this country was the kingdom of Hanover, the duchy of Brunswick, Westphalia, or Prussia proper. It has been all these things by turns, and it is certainly Prussia now. There is no doubt about that. And once, in addition, it was certainly English territory, in a manner of speaking. And once, without any figure of speech at all, it was much more certainly part of the Empire of France. Now the peace of Prussia broods all across the broad landscape. Conquered territory. That is what it all is. And the cross between a Hanover rat and an Irish terrier continued vociferously to defend it. After all, that was patriotism. Consider all the owners of this land, from Henry the Lion till the days of Imperial Chancellor Bateman Holdeck. Consider their splendid feats, or the mere tough obstinacy of their patriotism. Consider how they won great fights and lost all their territories. It does not matter whether it was George, by the grace of God, King of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, who got hold of Sella by marriage with Dorothea of that ilk, and then got rid of Dorothea. It does not matter that George the Second fought with the obstinacy of that rat dog at Dettingham. It does not matter that in 1809 the Duke Frederick William, quote, with only 1,900 men, pierced through the all-conquering French from Bohemia to the River Weser, unquote, he took Halberstadt by storm. He beat back the French before the very gates of the town which from our barrows we can see in the distance. He pierced through till he came to the North Sea and to England. He fought with his troop in the peninsula and fell at Quatre Bras two days before Waterloo. He and his 1900 men were the Black Brunswickers. And it is a good thing to remember what they did. And lying in the hot sun on the brown grass, looking at all this conquered territory, we remember that we too are conquered. It is an odd, sleepy thought. Far below us lies what was once, in a manner of speaking, English territory. On the barracks just by the town gate we shall see still the royal arms of England. And below us lies what was once Westphalian territory, and in a manner of speaking, we are Westphalian. Actually, we, the conquered, are subjects of the Grand Duke of Hessen, Darmstadt und by Rhein, a most charming potentate. But we Hessians, in moments of picturesque depression, are accustomed to say that we are not Prussians, but must Prussians. We don't want to be, but we cannot help it. We have against Prussia numbers of grievances connected with railways and all sorts of little things. So that we, lying among the barrows, are most extraordinarily conquered people. We could not be more conquered if we tried. 
the sun is very warm the sky is very blue the dog rabbit rat entertains us with the queer sound of its 240 barks a minute but are we english westphalian hessian a queer mixture like that of the rat rabbit dog are we going to get up and do anything about it not a bit of it we shall not be even as energetic as the triple quadruped we have not got so much as a bark in us and why it is disgraceful to be conquered it ought to be mortifying to lie with a threefold mailed heel upon our throats but really we cannot feel disgraced we cannot feel mortified we can only feel it odd that we don't for consider this tremendous prussia that lies all abroad across this land more evenly than the light of the sun itself look at the old old town on the horizon mark how its roofs smoulder in the sunlight and its cathedral towers burn with their burnished gold no doubt the man who could write triumphantly eight hundred years ago und dat ich mein no doubt his ghost if he be sitting beside us among the barrows sees little enough of change in this valley of the beloved line and yet from the corners of our eyes we can perceive the difference that there is just round the corner of the hill there comes a shower of apple blossoms they seem to be arranged in this absurd country where everything is decorative they seem to be arranged like a japanese screen to hide what the difference really is yet this screen the eye can pierce there they are five seven a dozen of them immensely tall thin black throwing up from their summits like defiant banners their plumes of smoke they are the factory chimneys and the factory chimneys are what along with peace prussia has given to these hanoverian lands and along with them go the broad white modern suburbs that from here the trees hide along with them go the easy pleasant electric trams the funny-looking electric trains that connect every ten minutes or so each of the large historic towns of this countryside prussia has conquered us but undoubtedly prussia has given us plenty along with peace we are probably much more poetic than any prussian all our poetry is said to come from south of frankfurt on the main and we cannot imagine any prussian lying conquered amongst barrows and moralizing about the barking of a dog that resembles a rat we are probably even more valiant in a swift way than the prussians it was not prussia who produced the black brunswickers we could probably get up and beat any blessed nation at any blessed moment but it will be just like langensalza at langensalza in 1866 king george the fifth and last of hanover beat the prussians quite handsomely but he woke up to find that every spot in hanover was in the possession of the prussians every spot with the exception of the field of langensalza and that is just like us on a hill that we can see from here our ancestors the common ancestors of us english westphalian hanoverians having hopelessly defeated a caesar in the forests a little to the south on that hill where there is an excellent tea garden our ancestors buried a complete solid silver table service for four roman noblemen yet the romans were about the only people who never conquered us after we had splendidly defeated them and we may suppose that that table service which our ancestors buried was about the only booty that we ever made by our heroism and kept for a reasonable space of time we did keep it for some eighteen hundred years and no doubt we should keep it today buried in a hill but in eighteen sixty eight some prussians coming rubbing about putting up a waterworks or something useful and modern found that table service 
it is now naturally in berlin and that is perhaps the moral of the whole story for us saxons and anglo-saxons it is like the moral of the rat dog that keeps up its barking perpetually through these sentences for some of us are poets and some of us in the great stretches of moor and heather that at the due seasons turn all this countryside wine purple into eternal distances some of us nay many of us have the second sight now and then we can produce heroes by the nineteen hundred or heroes in little boats full that go out and attack armadas but in between we seem to have our periods of slackness we have them inevitably the other day an excellent energetic and quite english lady said to a summer in kensington i wish to heaven the prussians would conquer this country and administer it then there would be an end of our disgusting slackness this seemed to us at the moment an astonishing opinion but lying here lazily among the barrows we realize suddenly that it is comprehensible enough if the prussians had england if the prussians had england you know lying here it almost seems inevitable not today not tomorrow not in ten years not in twenty not in any time into which there will survive any of the passions or bitternesses of today but in some time when the english won't care and the prussians will that is the real secret of it all there always comes a time when we don't care there never was and there never will be a time when these formidable products of the mark of brandenburg were not and will not be sleeplessly upon the watch it is like the case of the prisoner that somebody once put we don't remember where the prisoner given life must always in the end escape for the jailer must always in the end grow tired of the game and relax his vigilance he may wake to earnestness once more but then it will be too late and lying there the dog is still barking we suddenly begin to think of those green fertile and immensely wealthy islands in the western sea and just for a moment we think of what is called home politics and then with a quick shudder we drop the thought for we are not politicians of any politics that today can show beneath the light of the sun we are what is called high tories but immensely immensely high we are the people who win terrific victories against enormous odds in the game of tennis or in the other game of tennis that used to be played with stone balls but in the end some prussian some jew or some radical politician will sleeplessly get the best of us and take away the prizes of our game that is the way god arranges it who arranged alike the barrows the beloved little river of the line who set courage in the hearts of the nineteen hundred in black garments that went quote, from bohemia to the river weser unquote, and who said it in the hearts of the prussians that it is for them to administer and to administer and again to administer for the love of the thing just as for the love of words we utter them and with the shadow of the thought of home politics still upon us we say once more it is the will of god rat dog rabbit english westphalian hessian one of the three will rule us in the end prussian jew or hungry tradesman and for ourselves we say as we get up and go down the hill please god that it will be the prussian he at least will administer will enrich us and will leave us somewhere some barrows in the sun amongst which to lie possibly he will even put up an aussichtsturm and a tea garden at any rate he alone of those three sleepless ones will not strip us naked to the breezes we go down the hill by a sunken road on the hot turf just above our faces the absurd dog stands with its legs firmly planted and barks at us 
pushing through the hawthorn hedge of the first house in the village there comes another dog but it is a puppy it is smaller than a rat it resembles a brown cloth child's toy it is the child of the rat dog rabbit and it is more absurd than any creature reported by sir richard mandeville or by gulliver it plants its four legs in the warm turf and it barks and it barks we stand and look at it and it continues to bark it does not move nothing will move it it is administering that breed will not die out you see there are some people who desire accuracies though one write never so quote impressionistically unquote the city to which we have referred is not hanover is not brunswick is not osnabrück is not cellar is not any actual city but contains what we like to remember as an impression of all these similarly it is not even hamlin of the rats similarly we really know that this stretch of country was never pedagogically english territory it was country united under the sovereignty of the wearer of the english crown by what was called the personal union but that would have been good enough for prussia in the year eighteen thirty seven this country passed from under the sway of the ruler of great britain owing to a trifle called the salic law speaking in accurate english the salic law was not a trifle but it has not bothered the prussian gullet much some time ago i was standing in the yard of a brewery in ashford which is in kent an immense drayman was about to drink down a pot of ale he was called into the office and he set his pot on the tail of his cart some evil practical jokers who were standing by dropped a dead mouse into the pot out comes the drayman lifts the pot to his mouth drinks down at one draught the ale and the mouse and then having wiped his mouth upon his sleeve he remarked a hop or a cork to the wonder and admiration of all beholders end of section seventeen